webinar today is sponsored by WPS. We like to work in concert with our authors to make sure we bring you content that is applicable to what you're doing in your everyday profession. And I'm going to take a minute. Um, we've been doing this, WPS has been doing this for 70, over 70 years. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce our speaker for today. This is Dr. Cecil Reynolds. He is a professor emeritus and distinguished research scholar at Texas A&M University. He's earned his doctorate from the University of Georgia under the tutelage of Dr. Alan Kaufman with a major in school psychology and minors in statistics and clinical neuropsychology. During his long career as an educator, clinician, and researcher, he has developed many highly regarded psychological tests, authored more than 300 scholarly papers, and written or edited more than 50 books, including the Handbook of School Psychology, the Encyclopedia of Special Education, the Energetic Brain, and the Handbook of Clinical Child Neuropsychology. He has also been nationally recognized and received numerous awards. The man who does not need any introductions, Dr. Cecil Reynolds. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, first, I, I want to say I appreciate you taking time out of your busy day to spend some time with me uh, to talk about anxiety. I think this is a particularly good time to be talking about that because anxiety is certainly um, on all of our minds as we think about children and youth especially, but even as we think about ourselves um, with the pandemic and other issues in the country now and uh, schools getting ready to reopen and in some places actually have reopened. Uh, I think we're all very anxious about how that's going to play out and what's going to happen with the children that we serve. So I really do appreciate you taking time out from what I know is a very, very busy and stressful schedule. So thank you again. Uh, I do want you to know that at some point today, I will be discussing briefly several tests, including the Revised Children's Manifest Anxiety Scale Second Edition, and the Children's Measure of Obsessive Compulsive Symptoms, as well as an intervention manual entitled Strategies for Academic Success. You should know that I'm an author of each of these products and I receive royalties from their sales. I'm going to be as objective as I can be when I talk about them, uh, but ultimately you should be the judge of the quality and value of these materials in your practice. Um, just keep in mind, these are my babies. I'm gonna say nice things about them because what do you know about people and their babies? Everybody thinks their baby's pretty and I'm no exception, so you should take that into account. So let's just jump right in to talk about what is anxiety, because it's something we all know, and we all know intimately, actually, from personal experience. There's no one on here today who has not been anxious, so we know what that feels like. It's something we all experience. We experience it in everyday life. We worry and we have concerns for ourselves and others. Most anxiety then is normal. And even fear, which is a specialized form of anxiety, is adaptive in many circumstances. If you're out for a long walk on a trail somewhere and a poisonous snake comes out in front of you up on the trail, you should be afraid. That is a very adaptive response. There are many other situations in our lives where fear inhibits us from doing things that we shouldn't do. But it also can inhibit us from doing things that we should do. Excessive anxiety and fear can be a symptom of a disorder, but they can also be a disorder. So anxiety is one of those unusual states that can be a symptom or a disorder or can be perfectly normal in our daily life. An anxiety disorder typically includes shared features of fear and anxiety that interfere with daily life in some important arena, such as school, social settings, jobs, even in our family interaction. And it's this interference with life 
that pushes anxiety over the line into becoming a disorder. A more formal definition of anxiety, if you want to look at textbooks, tells us that a feeling of worry, nervousness, or unease, typically about an imminent event or something with an uncertain outcome, or in many cases, even an imaginary or highly improbable event, most often occurring with ruminative, non-productive thought. How often have you had a problem in your life and you kept thinking about what you were gonna do or what you could do or what you couldn't do? And you thought the same thing over and over and over. And you ruminated on it without going anywhere. That is the issue of ruminative non-productive thought. And it's very common in anxiety disorders and very disruptive to our ability to think and learn and solve problems. In fact, anxiety greatly inhibits our cognitive ability to engage in something called set shifting. We get locked into a singleized view of things when we have high anxiety and we lose our flexibility in problem solving. Common synonyms for anxiety that you'll see, words like worry, concern, apprehension, uh, consternation, unease, all of these you're familiar with. Anxiety can also be an unfulfilled desire to do something, typically accompanied by unease. And when this desire becomes extreme, it can evolve into obsessions and compulsions. I know you've all experienced at some point in your life an urge or plan very carefully to do something. And at some point you develop a need to do it. It's not just a want. And until you do it, you're anxious about it. And you need to do that. And any kind of unfulfilled desire that reaches that point induces anxiety until we find a release. And some of that is normal. And in some circumstances, it's adaptive. Anxiety can be a motivator. Anxiety, for example, can make us study for a big exam. It can make us learn our job better. But it can also result in obsessions and compulsions that really interfere greatly with our life and can lead to another kind of anxiety disorder. So keep in mind that anxiety itself may or may not be a disorder. Anxiety is not always related to an underlying diagnosis or condition. It may be caused temporarily, for example, by stress that can result from work, school, or personal relationships. Indeed, I think we all hope that the anxiety that we're having in these times is temporary and will pass. We just don't know how long that's going to take, which is anxiety provoking too, isn't it? Emotional trauma can induce brief anxiety, depending upon the level of trauma and what we do about it. Financial concern. And I mention this because financial concerns are affecting a very large part of our population. And children and youth, when they come to school or when they come to your office, will know about financial concerns their parents may have. And chances are what they know will be relatively inaccurate. And they'll be worried about it. It is very difficult for parents to completely hide concerns that they have about the family and the well-being of the family from their children. And financial concerns now are rampant in many, many middle class and lower groups within our population. Financial concerns that they have not experienced before. And children will be aware of the anxiety of their parents and they're going to be anxious about that too, in part because they're gonna be fearful. Stress caused by a chronic or serious medical condition can also induce temporary stress until we understand it 
or it passes. Any major event in our life or performance that we have to give, such as giving a webinar on anxiety, might be anxiety provoking. So something that we have to do or some big, big event that's coming, like perhaps a wedding. Anxiety can also be a side effect of certain medications. A lack of oxygen, panic. And think now about people who are wearing masks for the very first time. And you know, depending upon what kind of mask you have, sometimes those masks can make it feel like we're having trouble breathing. Or the air that we breathe can feel hotter and hotter. And we feel like we're not getting enough oxygen. And we're not in a place where we're not supposed to take off our mask. And there will be people who will panic in this situation. That panic is anxiety and fear. Alcohol consumption or drugs such as cocaine, especially any drugs that are in a class known as sympathomimetic. And I'm gonna comment more on those in, a, in just a minute. But all of these things can induce temporary states of anxiety. But if anxiety persists over time, in response to any of these events, even though it is typically temporary, when it does persist over time and it interferes significantly with important life functions, it becomes a disorder. And it's at that point that we want to be sure that we diagnose it and treat it. So a quick note for you on sympathomimetics and anxiety. Sympathomimetic drugs are exactly what the word sounds like. I know it's a big, scary, medical sounding word, but it is taken from two words. It reflects sympathetic nervous system and mimetic is a mimic, something that acts like something else. So a sympathomimetic drug is a stimulant compound that mimics the effects of the endogenous agonists of our sympathetic nervous system. The primary ones are known as catecholamines, which are very interesting because they function both as neurotransmitters and they function as hormones. The reason I mention them today is not for just, just because cocaine acts that way, but they're a common ingredient in nasal decongestants and their stimulants. Many students are thus routinely exposed to common sympathomimetic that exist in over-the-counter medications that they take, particularly during cold season or even during allergy season. Anxiety, especially what we think of as, as jitteriness, is a common response to sympathomimetics. But what some people don't realize is that ruminative thought can be induced by sympathomimetics. Have you ever seen someone on a stimulant? Have you ever seen someone on cocaine or someone on Ritalin or Adderall or Dexedrine or meth who grabs hold of a chain of thought and can't let go? And they keep going around and around and around with it. That's a common response to sympathomimetics. But I also wanted to point it out because some over-the-counter supplements, if you will, that are referred to on the web as homeopathic and sold to parents over-the-counter to treat ADHD are in fact natural sympathomimetics. And they can induce some of these same responses and this same jitteriness and anxiety and ruminative thought. So one of the things you want to be sure to do when you're assessing someone who's having anxiety is to take a really good history. And I'll come back to that point. Know if they're taking anything. If they've changed anything they're putting into their body. Know what medications they're on and include over-the-counter as well as supplements and vitamins, particularly those that are taken for ADHD or to help with anxiety or depression. Know about those. 
So let's go back now and talk about specifically what is an anxiety disorder. An anxiety disorder typically includes shared features of fear and anxiety that interfere with daily life in some important arena. Most commonly in children, this is school or social settings and family interactions. With older adolescents and adults, it can interfere with their job and their ability to do what they need to do just to make their daily life work and to function. It can even interfere to the extent that people will not leave their home. The presence of functional impairment, though, is the key to when anxiety crosses the line to becoming a disorder that needs to be diagnosed and needs treatment. The DSM-5 really reworked, reworked its section on anxiety disorders. And formally now, anxiety disorders are distinct from other disorders. And those disorders now only include, and they redid this list uh, again in DSM-5, generalized anxiety disorder, separation anxiety disorder, selective mutism is an anxiety disorder, specific phobias and agoraphobia are anxiety disorders social anxiety disorder or social phobia. Both, again, are anxiety disorders. Panic is an anxiety disorder. It is anxiety and fear at some of their strongest, strongest doses. Substance-induced or anxiety secondary to a medical condition is now listed as a distinct disorder. There are other disorders, though, where anxiety is a major culprit, and anxiety will underlie many of these disorders, and as we treat them, we also have to treat their underlying anxiety. Obsessive compulsive disorders are the most common that have anxiety-driven behavior. Obsessive compulsive disorders, including things like hoarding, Trichotillomania, as an example, excoriation, cutting. We have probably encountered, if you've been doing this long enough, you've encountered primarily adolescents uh, who cut, uh, cutters as they're known. And it's a way of alleviating anxiety, but it's a compulsive behavior. But they will tell you how it releases their anxiety and alleviates them temporarily. From that. And that's what obsessive compulsive behaviors do. They give us a release. You remember I talked just briefly earlier about incomplete action. Obsessive compulsive disorders center around what the, our mind is telling us are incomplete actions. And the only way to get a release is to complete them and complete them over and over and over. And the release that we get if we are having obsessive compulsive disorder is temporary. So we have to do it again. Body dysmorphic disorder has anxiety as its underlying culprit. Trauma and stressor related disorders, PTSD and reactive attachment disorder, for example, clearly have anxiety at their root. Acute stress disorder. While a temporary disorder, it is an anxiety response that drives you. Most adjustment disorders are anxiety driven and are again temporary. Anxiety is also a common symptom in other disorders, most prominently in depressive disorders. In fact, for decades, really, the pharmaceutical companies used to advertise anxiolytics, which is a fancy term for drugs that alleviate anxiety, as being required as a supplementary treatment for depression. And they even had, I, I recall one ad so well 
And this is uh, really not an appropriate medication for, for an anxiety disorder or for depression anymore, uh, unless you have psychotic symptoms with it. But there was a newly discovered drug called Melaril, which is a very powerful phenothiazine-related uh, tranquilizer. And when it first came out, Big Pharma was taking full-page ads in psychiatry journals, and I was uh, director of, uh, of psychology at a psychiatric hospital back then. And these full-page ads would say, underlying every depressive disorder is anxiety. And then, then there'd be a big banner ad, uh, ad I'm sorry, for Melorin. Um And uh, Melorin would stop you from being anxious but then most major tranquilizers do because you mostly just sit around and, uh, and you're in a stupor and do a lot of sleep. So uh, I'm glad we don't use that anymore. So you'll see all of these conditions, by the way, uh, in the schools. And of course, they're going to be walking into clinics more and more and more often. And those of you who are doing teletherapy and evaluations that way are going to see more and more symptoms uh, associated with all of these anxiety related disorders simply because of the state of our society right now. Uh, and that goes beyond the pandemic, uh, although I believe the pandemic is at the root of more of it than anything else. But anytime there is uncertainty, there is unrest, uh, more and more anxiety appears. But remember that a DSM diagnosis does not automatically make a child eligible for special education services or even a 504 plan. And this is something us folks in private practice sometimes forget. If we give a DSM diagnosis, we think the child should walk in and walk into special ed and get those services. And it doesn't always work that way. Special education has a different set of eligibility criteria. Uh, but we can facilitate that if we're in private practice, uh, if we do the right kind of evaluation and we write our reports well. For special education, an anxiety disorder or need any DSM diagnosis must lead to an adverse educational consequence for special education to be necessary. For 504, it must require an accommodation for educational success, but not be so severe as to rise to the level of requiring special education services. So those are kind of broad guidelines. So how does this fit more clearly in the ED eligibility guidelines? Remember that IDEIA, the emotional disturbance category, is a statement of eligibility. It is not really a diagnosis. It's a classification that results in eligibility for specialized services in the school in what are partially federally reimbursed programs. That's all that is. So emotionally disturbed for a child to be eligible for services in the public schools is defined as a condition exhibiting one or more of the following characteristics over a long period of time, which has not been defined, but that by default, most of us consider to be at least six months, and to a marked degree that adversely affects a child's educational performance. So there's that clause. There must be adverse impact on education. And education, by the way, is not just reading, writing, and arithmetic. It also has to do with developing socialization skills and lots of other aspects of becoming a good citizen. So one or more of the following characteristics, an inability to learn that cannot be explained by intellectual, sensory, or health factors, uh, the well-known exclusionary factors, an inability to build or maintain satisfactory interpersonal relationships with peers and teachers. And by the way, all of my school psychs out there, remember there's lots of folks on this who are not school psychs today. So I know you all have this memorized, but not everyone does if they're not serving folks in the school. Inappropriate types of behaviors or feelings under normal circumstances, that certainly 
his anxiety, a general pervasive mood of unhappiness or depression, a tendency to develop physical symptoms or fear associated with personal or school problems. The definition goes on to say that the term does include schizophrenia. It does not apply to children who are socially maladjusted unless it is determined that they have an emotional disturbance. And I just want to point out and remind everybody that there are children who are emotionally disturbed who are socially maladjusted too. Being socially maladjusted does not grant you immunity from any known emotional disorder. There are no immunizing disorders. And in fact, the majority of the people that I see that I would consider to be socially maladjusted also have a diagnosable emotional or behavioral disorder that goes beyond their social maladjustment. So uh, be careful about excluding kids because you think they're socially maladjusted. Most of those kids also have an emotional or behavioral disorder. In the presence of adverse educational impact and functional impairment, anxiety can really make a child eligible for special education services in these areas. An inability to build or maintain satisfactory interpersonal relationships with peers and teachers. If you're really anxious about socialization, for example, you're anxious about being around others, um, you're fearful, you're going to have a difficult time doing that. Inappropriate types of behavior or feelings. Anxiety at the level of functional impairment is clearly an inappropriate feeling under normal circumstances. A general pervasive mood of unhappiness or depression. If you are functionally impaired due to a very high anxiety level, you are unhappy. You simply are. I've never met anyone who wasn't. If they met those criteria, if their activities of daily life were impaired, by a really high anxiety level, they were unhappy. A tendency to develop physical symptoms or fears associated with personal or school problems. Certainly, all of the phobias, agoraphobia, all of those fall into fears associated with personal or even school problems. School refusal, for example. And all the physical symptoms, all the somatic symptoms and somatoform disorders that are out there have an underlay of anxiety. So pay attention to these factors and know that children with anxiety disorders, if they are functionally impaired, can qualify for services under all of these areas. So let's talk a little bit about assessing anxiety. Uh, and I like to talk about the RCMAS-2 and the CMOPs when I do that. The Revised Children's Manifest Anxiety Scale uh, is very near and dear to my heart. Um, uh, and I just want to comment on why just a little bit. It was my very first test. Um, my 47th commercially published test is being released the last week of August. and this was my first. Uh, I published the Revised Children's Manifest Anxiety Scale when I was a graduate student. And um, it was one of the most wonderful things I, I ever did. I've gotten so much positive feedback about it throughout my entire career. So thank you all for using it, by the way, and appreciating it, and, uh, and for sending me the occasional emails and comments that I get about uh, how helpful it's been. So it's very near and dear to me. Also, the children's measure of obsessive compulsive symptoms, which gets a, assessing a very specialized set of behaviors that are driven by anxiety. The Revised Children's Manifest Anxiety Scale, second edition, measures the level and nature of anxiety as experienced by children today. Using a simple yes, no format, it is available online. You can do remote administration with it. 
Um, and it's available in multiple languages, as you'll see momentarily. It is the most frequently used measure of children's anxiety in the English-speaking world. It's a 49-item scale, norm for ages six years through 19 years. It's also commercially available in Spanish, Italian, and Korean. It is, uh, or has been translated into about 15 other languages under specialized licenses for different applications around the world. If you have need of it uh, for a specialized application, you may be able uh, to get such a license and you can contact um, WPS about that. It is not normed in those other languages, but it is available and normed and standardized also in Spanish, Italian, and Korean. It's available for paper and pencil as well as online administration and storage. There's a screening short form available as well, although 49 items is not that long, uh, but you can get a short form uh, and use this. It emphasizes, as you might suspect from the title, the manifestation of anxiety in both internalized thoughts and externalized behavior. So we want to see how children manifest their anxiety because knowing how it's manifest is one of the keys to treatment, particularly cognitive behavioral treatments, which are the most effective treatments that we know of for anxiety. The RCMAS2 gives you a total anxiety score, a physiological anxiety score, worry, and social concerns and concentration. We know that anxiety has somatic and physiological effects. It increases heartbeat. In fact, it's common uh, to use certain uh, blood pressure medicines with some people who have anxiety uh, to dampen the physiological response that they have. That's a very common supplement to anxiety treatment. It's used less so with children, but starting with adolescents and adults, it's not uncommon to see uh, certain alpha and beta blockers used worry, 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 we know about, and that ruminative thought process, uh, particularly the non-productive ruminative thought, and social concerns and concentration. Uh, we get so concerned, we can't concentrate on anything. And that coupled with worry can really debilitate our daily life. We also have a 10 item set that looks at performance anxiety, and you can, uh, see more about this in the manual. Uh, we don't give you a score for this. We didn't scale that on the RCMS2. We may or may not on RCMS3. Um, but we specifically have items you can look at to look at performance anxiety, and I'll show you those momentarily. We also have two validity scales, uh, an inconsistency index that will detect children who are not responding reliably to the scale, and we also have a defensiveness index. We, I called it the life scale in the RCMAS, but that's become politically incorrect. It's really a denial scale. It's kids who are just going to be very defensive and not let you know that they have anxiety. They're like, hey, everything's fine in my life. Chances are if everything's fine, they wouldn't be sitting across the desk. The items that ask about performance anxiety uh, are these. And you'll see that all of these uh, deal with either carrying out some action or being in the presence of others. Uh, so uh, these items specifically look at performance anxiety. We have qualitative descriptors for the RCMS two school ranges, uh, for example, uh, 71 and higher, Typically, that level of anxiety is extremely problematic for an individual. 61 to 70, moderately problematic. 40 to 60, no more problematic than for most students. Although when you get around that 60 cutoff, you really want to pay attention to that and you want to look at all the subscales. Don't just look at the total score. Uh, if you see elevations on any of those subscales uh, that are above 60, 
you want to be concerned. 39 and lower, uh, these kids are probably pretty laid back or pretty defensive. So they are experiencing fewer problems than most people in their daily life with feelings of anxiety or any fear uh, that they may have. The children's measure of obsessive compulsive symptoms is newer. We developed this uh, a few years ago. Uh, it's used primarily in clinical symptoms, but I really wanted to talk about it today because it's very useful in school settings. Uh, even though it's most widely used in clinical settings. Um, and it's designed to assess obsessive and compulsive behaviors, both actions that we can observe as well as thoughts. And it assesses their impact on the child or adolescent. It's very useful to, for the diagnosis of obsessive compulsive disorders in children and youth but it's also intended to be useful in assessing the impact of obsessive compulsive symptoms, even in subclinical cases. And as I mentioned earlier, it's not at all uncommon for individuals who have high levels of anxiety to have at least some obsessive or compulsive symptoms to engage in non-productive ruminative thought, to obsess about action, to feel compelled to do something, and to be anxious if they can't complete it, that feeling of incompleteness that drives compulsive behavior. So we will see that even in individuals who don't have a diagnosable obsessive compulsive disorder but do have some symptoms that are in concert with their anxiety. It's a 56 item self-report scale. It's norm for ages eight years through 19 years. So it covers pretty much uh, most of the elementary and higher school age range. It's paper and pencil only at this time. It's not yet online. Uh, I don't have any issue with it reading it, with you reading it to people through a telehealth administration uh, due to the type of scale that it is. Uh, and none of the items are unduly personal. So uh, although they're all personal, uh, they're not unduly so. So I think you could do that in a telehealth environment. Uh, it's only published in English right now, uh, but you can also read it to those fluent in other languages, uh, provided you're fluent in the language. Uh, let's make that caveat. Um, the CMOPS provides two summary scores along with six problem area scores. The two global scores are the total problems index and an impact score. So the total problems looks across all areas of obsessive compulsive symptoms with children and youth. And then the impact score, which we felt was really important to have, indicates whether or not these behaviors it actually result in some kind of functional impairment. Does it impact your daily life and impair your ability to function? Do they have adverse consequences? The six problem areas are fear of contamination, rituals, which you'll be very familiar with in OCD, intrusive thought, which is probably one of the biggest issues in obsessive compulsive disorder that goes unassessed and undetected in anxiety disorders when we also don't have enough symptoms of OCD to make that diagnosis. Checking, checking, constantly going back and checking. Uh, how many times did, uh, uh, did you have to go back to the stove to be sure it was turned off? 20, 30? more, fear of mistakes and harm uh, that really become debilitating, picking and slowing. Uh, these are all problem areas that we see in obsessive compulsive disorders. We have two validity scales similar to those on the RCMS2 and other tests of our thought. We have the inconsistency index that will detect um, when an individual is not responding reliably to the items. 
and then the defensiveness game, which tells us about folks who don't want to tell us about their issues. These scores are highly reliable. Uh, most of the, at almost every age, um, the alpha coefficients are in the 80s and in many cases in the 0.90s. So all of these scores are going to be useful to you then in individual case assessment and diagnosis. We know that obsessive compulsive disorder has high comorbidity with all anxiety disorders. It has high comorbidity with ADHD. And sometimes we don't assess these with ADHD individuals and we should. Very high comorbidity rates between obsessive compulsive symptoms, obsessive compulsive disorders, and ADHD. And it's just insufficiently assessed, particularly in the schools historically, often we just don't ask. And uh, we'd like to promote asking uh, because I think you'll find a lot more of it. This is not a case where we want to engage in don't ask, don't tell. We need to know. It's more prevalent than believed. Obsessive, uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, if I can make my mouth work, uh, is about a 3% prevalence rate in the population at any given time. So that's more than you're probably diagnosing. So what about ED eligibility and obsessive compulsion? The CMOX is a good fit for the federal definition of ED as well. The results match up very well to criteria C, inappropriate types of behavior or feelings under normal circumstances. If you have an obsessive compulsive disorder, you're engaging clearly in inappropriate types of behavior and feelings under what are completely normal conditions. There's no question about that. It also matches up well to a tendency to develop physical symptoms or fears associated with personal or school problems. And here, it's really the fear component that is most common in OCD. If I don't do this, if I don't do this, and I don't do this over and over and over, I become very, very fearful of what will happen. And it really becomes totally debilitating for some individuals. I saw a young woman once, um, I want to say uh, now she was about 10 years old and it took her a minimum of 30 minutes every morning to leave her house and walk out to the car to ride to school with her mother. And this was a very difficult issue for them because she wouldn't let anyone else open the front door for her. And she had to get her hand and fingers on the doorknob in exactly the right position or she was fearful something really bad would happen when she tried to open the door. And it would sometimes take her a half an hour to determine that she had her fingers in exactly the right position before she would grip and turn the doorknob. And no one else could do that for her, which would have certainly been a simple solution. And this began to generalize to other settings where she couldn't open a door. Um, and that was when I started seeing her. So it's very interesting the manifestation of these can take. In RTI, the CMOX is very useful in setting baseline behaviors and progress monitoring. So you can count these behaviors, how often they occur and how they interfere. And also relate these to a wide array of what can be very unacceptable behaviors at school. And you can determine if these are linked to OCD symptoms or not. A couple of comments on making a diagnosis. Be sure you don't interpret any test data blindly, particularly now. Context is critical. You would certainly interpret this response to a Rorschach card very differently if you knew it came from a flying insect. I, 
sorry, this has nothing to do with it other than the fact that bugs and Rorschachs just seem to go together, and I couldn't resist that. Uh, but remember that history and context are critical in determining test scores. A careful history is the most powerful weapon in the arsenal of every clinician. No matter if we're looking at brain behavior relationships or we're looking at emotional disorders, we have to have a detailed history to get it right. Context is always important. Know the context of the child's life. You may think that looks like dinner, but I promise you to a chicken, that's a horror movie. Know who you're evaluating. Symptoms do not mean the same thing for everyone. It's why we engage in individualized diagnosis. Do not diagnose raccoons with insomnia because they stay up all night. It's part of what they do. If you saw someone with these 13 symptoms, if you saw a nine-year-old boy who you documented clearly had every one of these 13 symptoms, what would your diagnosis be? I can tell you that all 13 of these symptoms overlap 100% with these three disorders. So how can you possibly distinguish them? All three of these disorders have a different history and a different context. And even though you've documented all 13 of these symptoms, you cannot get the diagnosis right unless you know the history and the context of the child's life. And no matter what diagnosis, please include parents in your intervention. A recent very detailed extensive meta-analysis showed that when you include parents as part of the treatment and intervention process for children and adolescents with emotional and behavioral disorders, treatment effects improve between a half and a full standard deviation. And those are big effects in psychology. I'm also, by the way, predicting an increase in test anxiety this coming school year, and I don't think I have to explain why, uh, given all the things that are going on. So I want to spend about five minutes talking about this, and then hopefully we'll have time for a question or two. I apologize, this is taking me just a little bit longer than, I, than my practice session. So, this intervention manual, Strategies for Academic Success, has three sections. Section one talks about learning strategies and what they are. Section two has a chapter for teaching study strategies, writing and research strategies, reading comprehension, note taking, listening, time management, and test taking strategies. But I want to get to section three. Here we have three chapters, each for one of the following areas teaching students to understand and ameliorate their test anxiety is one of those chapters. Also, how to develop concentration and attention strategies and how to increase their academic motivation. All of these, by the way, have very detailed scripted plans using direct instruction. There are a couple of helpful appendices that you can look at here too, and we provide you with a lot of actually free to reproduce material in an appendix. But we know that test anxiety, which is what I wanted to get to, interferes with test performance. No matter how much you know, if you're anxious about your performance, if you're anxious about taking that test, a little anxiety helps us because it makes us study more and motivates us. But you can see there's a peak there where anxiety really hammers. What can we do to reduce test anxiety? Well, Strategies for Academic Success says we should teach test taking skills and strategies. And we have an entire chapter of scripted lessons for exactly how to do this. Also, teach students how tests are developed or designed. This takes the mystery and unknowns out of it and reduces fear of tests and testing. Teach study skills. This is another key that most kids actually don't know how to study. And if we teach them how, it reduces their anxiety about test taking. We have scripted plans for all of this. 
but also we have six other strategies for individual students for you to work one-on-one -on -one to overcome or lessen test anxiety, and 12 strategies that are all scripted that you can give to parents to use at home to reduce or eliminate test anxiety. I think those are gonna be tremendously useful in the current environment. And these are things you can share with the parent, you can give to them, you can provide them this manual. Uh, it's not a restricted purchase. Um, so it has a great deal in there to direct parents how to do this with their kids at home. When it's truly, truly severe and really severely debilitating, there are another set of strategies that you can employ in more severe and extreme cases. All of these have been sourced from an evidence-based review of effectiveness. So at that point, I'm going to stop. Uh, I did want to be sure we had time for at least one or two questions. And again, I apologize for running a little longer than my practice session. This is the very first time I've given this talk. So hopefully you'll be understanding. Stephanie, is there any really hot question or two I can deal with? Well, we have 52 questions in the Q&A. <laughs> well, um, I can do one per second. <laughs> okay. Uh, I think there are uh, a good number of people who ask several questions that have to do with ADHD and anxiety. Uh, I'm going to give you a two-part because it hits on a couple of the questions at one time. And that is, uh, how do you distinguish between ADHD and anxiety when some of the symptoms are very similar? And then would you consider anxiety falling under the special education category of other health impaired? Uh, well, let me take those uh, in reverse order. I would typically not consider anxiety as other health impaired. Uh, if you go back and look at the materials when you get it, I think I showed how you match up anxiety to the current uh, emotional and behavioral disorder um, categories. It's a better fit there to me. Um, if it has induced a medically um, uh, appearing condition, a somatoform disorder, for example, still it's an underlying psychological issue and not a health impairment. Uh, so I would not. But uh, in saying that, I know there are going to be individual cases where I might reconsider that, but it would be unusual. Differentiating anxiety from ADHD requires that you use a broad band assessment to diagnose ADHD because ADHD has co high comorbidity, not just with anxiety, but with depression, with some other externalizing disorders and with obsessive compulsive disorder. So you have to assess all of those areas and then look at the dominant features. And that's the only way you're going to differentiate ADHD from the mimics. Certainly anxiety can make a child look like they have ADHD. That's why narrow band ADHD scales over diagnose ADHD inappropriately. You need broad band behavioral assessment scales to get it right. And it may be that a child not only has ADHD, but also has an anxiety disorder or has ADHD and depression, or has ADHD and something else. So we have to look at broadband scales and look at the relative elevations of the different areas. One more. Okay. Uh, how, what advice would you give for those who are assessing preschool children uh, when they're suspecting anxiety? With preschool children, when I was assessing anxiety, I made sure I took very, very detailed histories from the parents about any history of change in the child's behavior. And then I actually, at that age, if I suspected anxiety issues, I did a lot of play assessments with kids. I took them in my play therapy room and spent time with them and observed how they interacted in the context of play, uh, but I'm also, I'm, I'm certified as a play therapist, so that worked really well for me. So it depends on your skills, but a lot of good observations 
and extremely detailed histories and pay special attention to any history of alterations in the child's behavior in thinking about anxiety in preschoolers. Someone else asked the question, uh, why do you think the DSM-5 took OCD out of the anxiety disorder section since it's underlain by anxiety? I have never understood why this person said. Well, I can speculate that about that all day, but what I can tell you is that it was a huge fight among the author teams and the committees, uh, and it really came down to politics and who had the most power at the time. Uh, in the back rooms when all of that was being debated. And uh, people who specialized in OCD wanted it pulled out and wanted it made a separate category. But clearly anxiety is the underlying driving force for OCD. I don't so know, what, it's, oh. it's three o'clock. I don't know if this is gonna automatically cut us off. I'm happy to stick around for another five minutes and do questions. Uh, I don't think, I, no, I don't think we'll be cut off. So those who want to okay. hear the answers to the rest of the questions that we have will be, uh, well, obviously we're not going to get to all of them, but we do have hopes to uh, collate those questions and maybe get them to you and, and see if you have responses for them. Some of them are repeats, but, um, but if okay. you hang in there for a few minutes, we'll answer some more questions. Okay. Well, and let's then, do a couple more and then I'm okay, going to we'll, we'll two more. Okay. Yep, we'll do two more questions. So this one, um, we are excited. I did want to let you know that I did put in the in the chat box so everybody is informed that we we are looking for people to do data collection for the RCMAS three. Some people had asked questions about um, whether there was a parent and teacher portion. So we're happy to say that that will happen. One of the things, uh, the questions that people have asked is about when there are major things going on in the world. For example, we've had some major things happen in the past. We've had the pandemic, things like that. Are there any recommendations for treating anxiety related to those major things? How do you go about assessing for that during a time like that? Uh, you know, what do you what do you suggest? Well, the, the assessment and treatment are the same. Uh, the diagnosis is different. It's either an adjustment disorder or an acute stress disorder as opposed to being an anxiety disorder. If it does not go away, if it persists for six months or longer, then it becomes a more chronic anxiety disorder. But in terms of how we assess it, it's the same. We take a really good history. When did it start? When did these symptoms appear? And we can then correlate that with what's been happening in society and changes in a person's life. So we know from the history whether or not the anxiety symptoms that we've assessed and documented the level of anxiety, is it new or has it been there for a long time? That has to come from history and context of the person's life. But we treat them the same way. Uh, again, cognitive behavioral interventions are by far the single most effective in treating anxiety, but there are other methods of treating anxiety as well. Uh, depending upon the event that has caused the anxiety, we may engage in other treatments. And, and uh, we have treatment manuals out for that, and you will find uh, those elsewhere, too. Uh, we don't have time to go through detailed aspects of treatment today. But the measurement and intervention are the same. Okay, uh, got last to question. Have those, oh, let me just, just reemphasize, I can't say this enough. You have to have a detailed history and understand the context of the person's life. Okay, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, I thought you paused, so I thought you were finished. Uh, was there a difference, uh, any difference found between children with poor reading skills who need that rating scale read to them and those who can read the scale themselves? Was this compared at all? We have not. Uh, we did not do a very large study of that. But when we looked at the data, we looked at it um, at the younger age groups, and we knew who had had it read to them and who hadn't, and we didn't see any difference in school. Okay, great. So uh, we're going to go ahead and wrap up. If you'd advance the slide, if you wouldn't mind. Okay. All right. So 
Um, I figured everybody would be cheering that it was over by now. So thank you. <laughs> and then I just want everyone to know that if you have any specific uh, product uh, assessment related questions, you can send an email to consult at wpspublish.com. The people here on the pictures are the assessment consultants for WPS who can help you with your assessment related questions. And you can go to www.wpspublish.com to look at any of our products at any time. Uh, also, if you would like to get on the online evaluation system, one of the assessment consultants can help you with that. So we also have some advice on telepractice. We have a telepractice page. We have a content hub that gives a lot of information uh, about content related to the information that was covered here and other information. And we have video resources as well. I would uh, definitely um, ask you to also go to the YouTube, our YouTube channel and search for Western Psychological Services. We have a lot of really informative videos there as well. Is this the last slide, Cecil? I just want to. I believe definitely. so. All right. So that is it. And we are wrapping up our webinar for today. Thank you, Dr. Cecil Reynolds, for all of your knowledge that you shared today. Mm -hmm.